Okay, thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is Alexander Richard, and I will tell you something about weekly supervised action learning with RNN-based fine-to-course modeling. Well, what do we actually mean by action learning or action labeling? Um, assume we are given a video X with T frames, then we want to find for each frame a label of the action that is actually occurring in this frame. Like uh, in this example, we have a video of Angela Merkel doing nothing, eating something, again doing nothing, and then having a drink in the end. So what we want to achieve is to assign a label to each frame. So the first frame would be background, the next frames would be eating, and so on for all the actions that occur in the video. This would be quite easy to tackle with um, deep learning approaches if we would have frame-wise annotation in our training data. But we assume that we only have weekly supervised data. Meaning our training data looks somewhat like this. So we have multiple videos, and the only annotation that we have is actually the sequence, the ordered sequence of actions that are occurring. For example, here we have Obama, and we only know he's playing golf, he's eating, and he's playing golf again. But we have no clue about where in the temporal position this actually happens. So as I said, for the fully supervised approach, one could simply say um, we use deep learning uh, works, and yeah. There are already some methods uh, that did this. For the weekly supervised uh, approaches, it's a bit different, and most methods borrow ideas from speech recognition. For example, this uh, second part is a classical speech recognition system consisting out of a hidden Markov model and a Gaussian mixture model. The um, third work here is an extended version of CTCs, so basically a recurrent network-based method. And in our work, we basically combine components of both of these. So let's put it in a more probabilistic uh, setting. So assume we have this video, which you have already seen before, and we want to infer all the actions that happen within the video. So what we actually want to have is a probability of all the frame-wise actions given the video, and we want to maximize this probability over all possible action labelings. First thing we do is we factorize this probability, so we get a prior on the actions uh, that we actually want to um, hypothesize on the frames. And one could model this prior using n-grams, for example, but it's quite important in our case to have long-range dependencies here. So we use a finite grammar to model this with a huge advantage um, that we cover really from the beginning to the end of the video all the dependencies. For example, if I would take a plate out of a cupboard, would prepare lunch, would clean up the plate, and in the end put it back to the cupboard, it's important to know at the very end of the video that I took it out at the very beginning. So a finite grammar covering the whole sequence is quite beneficial here. And how does this look like exactly? Well, in training we already know the ordered action sequences. So we know we have, um, for example, for the first training video, green action followed by blue action. For the second video, red action followed by green action followed by blue action, and so on. But for the testing, or for the inference, we just have the video itself, so we need to construct a grammar out of the training data. We use a very simple approach here and just add all the paths that we see during training to our grammar. And if we now assign um, a constant probability to each of these paths, then actually uh, this prior factor cancels if we maximize only over those paths that are generated by the grammar. Okay, so the problem is already a bit simplified now. So we have to look how we actually model this probability that is remaining, uh, this P of video given labels. We make a Markov assumption and say it's the product of all frames of probability of frame given action label, but we want to use an RNN to model this, so we need a posterior probability. Simple trick, we apply a base rule to obtain action label given video frame, and we need to divide by the prior in order to get something that is uh, proportional to the original probability. Okay, in order to model this uh, probability, we now use a recurrent network. So the inputs are all the video frames, then we have a layer of gated recurrent units, and at each frame, the output is a distribution over all action labels given all previously seen frames. Why do we use this gated recurrent units? Well, they have a huge advantage. They can uh, give a high or low weight to the current frame, and they can also decide to give a high or low weight to the temporal context that has been seen. So let's make a brief example. We have here the current frame circled in red, and it's clearly a frame belonging to this green action class. And, um, well, the gate recurrent unit can decide to put a high weight on this frame and get a clear uh, probabilistic output. You may now argue a frame-wise model would be able to do the same, of course. But we have another example where a frame-wise model would fail. Here the frame, the example, is quite noisy. It's not clear to say to which action class it would belong. But from the temporal context, it's pretty obvious that it should be the green class. So the get recurrent unit can now say, I put a high emphasis 
on the temporal context and still get a high response for the correct action class. The point with these RNNs is they are very good at modeling local temporal context, but actions and videos can be very long, several hundreds, even several thousand frames long. So neural networks usually struggle to model these long-term contexts. So what we do is introduce a course model, which basically um, is the idea of sub-segmenting each action class into multiple sub-actions. These sub-actions are hidden states, so basically we end up with a hidden Markov model formulation um, with sub-actions as hidden variables. Before, we wanted to maximize over um, all the possible frame alignments on the, uh, on the action level. Now we want to do the same on the state level. This can be solved as soon as we have frame-wise probabilities for uh, the actions using a simple Viterbi algorithm. So now that we have the cost model, how does this affect the RNN? Before, we wanted to predict action labels, P of A given X. Now, of course, we want to predict the sub-action labels. Nothing more changes. So we have seen the cost model now and the fine-grained model, and they somehow interact because the fine-grained model is very good at predicting local temporal context, and the cost model makes sure that these action classes that we want to predict are actually comparably short. How do we now train this model? Well, assume we are given a video and an action transcript like green class, red class, uh, green class, blue class, red class. First thing we do is linearly subdivide these classes among the video frames. And then we, again, linearly subdivide the sub-actions that we have among uh, our previous uh, subdivision. So now we have, for each frame, a sub-action class. So we can use this as ground truth to train the RNN and the hidden Markov model. And once we train the model, we can use it to infer, according to this model now, the best labeling of sub-actions. This may look, for example, like this. One could now say we take this one and iterate the training until it converges, but maybe you already see that there is a problem. The blue class in the middle got very long, leading to the fact that also the sub-actions got very long, so we are again in this problem that we have very many frames within one sub-action and the RNN will struggle to actually solve this problem. So what we do is redistribute these action frames so that on average each sub-action has the same number of frames. And this should help the RNN because the RNN can now really focus on its comfort zone of a small local temporal context. Okay, we iterate this until it converges and then our system is trained. Let's have a brief look at some experimental results. We used the breakfast data set, roughly three and a half million frames and 48 action classes in uh, one and a half thousand or even some more clips. And as features, we use improved dense trajectories, or Fisher vectors of improved dense trajectories, which we extract frame-wise. As I already mentioned, deep learning approaches struggle since we do not have any frame-wise annotations. So at the moment, uh, these uh, dense trajectory features still uh, perform equally or slightly better and are also used in all related work. So let's, uh, let's have a brief look at the cost model. First case, we have no sub-action, meaning we have no cost model at all. That means we directly have to model the actions. So the RNN has to take care of the complete temporal context, even of the very long actions. And as already mentioned, it's not very good at this. You see it at the blue curve, the performance is quite poor. But as soon as we add the sub-actions, it gets much better. Um, so we have um, this, this distribution, and you already see in the red curve, we, we gain a lot. But there are still some problems because now we have the case that the sub-actions can get very long during training when we do the re-estimation on video level. So if we now redistribute the sub-actions in a way that they are on average always of the same length, the RNN can really perform at, at its best because um, all the chunks will be comparably small and will enable the RNN to capture the complete temporal context that is, that is necessary. This is the brown curve that you can see and you see that we obtain the best results here. Concerning the fine-grained model itself, is it really necessary to use an RNN? I have already given you some um, examples where RNNs can perform better than frame-wise models, and here we also see it in the numbers. So we use a Gaussian mixture model as some classical approach that is frequently combined with hidden Markov models, a multi-layer perceptron that has the same number of parameters as the gated recurrent unit network, and of course our recurrent network. And what you see is that both the GMM and the MLP, blue and red curve, are clearly worse than the RNN model that we have. Concerning some state-of-the-art results, we can compare to work of Boyanowski that used uh, discriminative clustering. I have to admit this is not a completely fair comparison because this work was designed to only align um, 
video frames to actions if the ordering is already known during inference. So if the ordering is not known during inference, as in our case, the performance is not very good. But these other two methods, the um, speech recognition methods uh, and the extended CTC version, um, they are already quite good. Our system is slightly better um, if we just used the fixed sub-actions, but if we introduce this sub-action re-estimation together with the RNN, we can see that there is a huge boost of 5% in performance due to the fact that the RNN is really supported by the course model to always be in its comfort zone, to always have to deal with the local temporal information only. Yeah, okay, these were only some few numbers, so if you're interested in getting some more, feel free to visit me at the poster. We will also have a small demo of the system, and if you want to mess around with the code by yourself, check it out on GitHub and work with it. Thanks for your attention.